Welcome to our online Joints in Motion class. Please be sure to watch all three videos in which we'll go over everything you should need to know to prepare and recover from your joint replacement surgery. The more prepared you are going into surgery, the better your recovery will be. It is very helpful to have a coach to support you, both while you're in the hospital and once you go home. Your coach can be a family member, friend, significant other, anyone who's available to lend a helping hand and support while you're in the hospital and once you go home. Before surgery, you will want to prepare your home. By that we mean make sure there's nothing you can trip over, like throw rugs or extension cords. Also, think about things you use frequently and have them within easy reach. For example, if you like to have a cup of coffee in the morning, keep the coffee canister on the counter, not on the top shelf where you're going to have to reach for it. Make sure any household chores like laundry are done, so you don't have to do them when you get home. And meals in the freezer work great. You can just pop them in the microwave, or even a service like Grubhub on speed dial. Also, don't forget your pet's needs. If you have a 150-pound Rottweiler, you probably won't be able to walk him after surgery. While you're here in the hospital, it's helpful to have your coach attend a therapy session so we can teach him or her about your exercises and we'll teach both of you how to take care of your incision and how to take your prescribed medications. Think about any help you're going to need once you're home. Help getting to therapy appointments, someone to help with meals and chores, someone to encourage you to do your exercises, and someone to help change your bandage if needed and take your medications. So this is a team effort and your coach is an important part of the team. Getting started, one of the first people you'll talk with is your surgeon's administrator. They're going to be the one to schedule your surgery and tell you about your next steps. You may be told to get your blood work and other tests done by your own doctor, and our pre-surgical nurse will interview you by phone, or you may be asked to come into our hospital to have all your labs and clearances done here. Regardless of the process, we will want to know all of your home medications. When you talk with the pre-surgical nurse, make sure you have a list in front of you, including dosages. Make sure to include any vitamins and supplements, since many can interfere with surgery. If you take any blood thinners, including aspirin, ibuprofen products, Coumadin, Eliquis, or many supplements, you'll typically be asked to stop taking at least a week before surgery. And if you do smoke, try to quit before coming in. We're a non-smoking hospital, and it can be a miserable couple of days for you, and a miserable couple of days for us, if you can't smoke. Plus, smoking does slow healing, and can lead to infection. Once we have all your information, your surgeon and anesthesiologist will look them over to make sure that you're good to go for surgery. If, though, within a week or so before surgery, you come down with any kind of cough, fever, rash, or just feel unwell, Call your surgeon's office to let them know. Your surgeon may want to postpone your surgery, and we would rather you find out a week in advance than the day of. We do recommend that you get a pneumonia vaccine if you haven't already had one, if you're over the age of 65, have any lung issues, or any other condition that make you more vulnerable, such as rheumatoid arthritis. We also recommend a flu vaccine if you're coming in during flu season. Neither are mandatory, but if you choose to get vaccinated, give yourself at least two weeks before surgery if possible so you have time to develop immunity. What to bring to the hospital? Bring a photo ID, insurance card, any kind of copay you may have. Also bring a list of your medications. Even though the pre-surgical nurse wrote it all down, we like to look it over and make sure nothing has changed and everything was written down correctly. Bring any personal hygiene items, such as toothbrush, dentures, and hearing aids, as well as your mobile phone. We have no restrictions on cell phones on the surgical unit. Also, bring something to wear. We're going to get you dressed. Hospital gowns are for sick people, and you're not sick. You're going to be walking up and down the halls. And for everyone's sake, we don't want you flapping in the breeze. If you're having knee surgery, you'll want wide-legged shorts. You may have a thick bandage on your knee right after surgery, and it will be hard to pull long pants up over it. If you're having hip surgery, something with a loose waistband, like sweatpants, works great. You don't want something tight pressing on your incision area. Bring a pair of supportive shoes with a back that you can adjust with laces or Velcro to make looser or tighter, since you may have some swelling. Sneakers work great. If you already have a walker or cane, bring it so our physical therapist can make sure it's adjusted correctly. And if you use a CPAP machine for sleeping, make sure you bring that as well. 
what not to bring. Basically, don't bring anything of value. We have a lot of visitors coming and going, and I would hate for anything of value to go missing. We do have a security office that can lock up your valuables in a safe and return when you're ready to go home. Also, don't bring your own medications unless you're specifically told to. What happens when you bring your own medication is that we give you a dose, you tend to forget because you're on some pretty good medicine here, and you take a dose of your own. So you end up double dosing. For safety reasons, we like to control the medication. The only exception is if you take something unusual that we don't carry in the hospital, in which case the pre-surgical nurse will give you the heads up to bring your own. To prevent infection, you'll want to pick up a bottle of chlorhexidine or Hibiclens soap, which is available in any drugstore. You'll want to do three showers with the Hibiclens, the morning of surgery, the day before, and two days before. Shower as you normally would with your regular soap, shampoo, and conditioner, then step out of the shower stream and apply the Hibiclens from your neck down, excluding your genital area. Really scrub it into the area where you'll be having surgery and let it sit on your skin for about two to three minutes. Then step back into the shower, rinse it off, and dry off with a freshly laundered towel. This will help kill any bacteria that live on your skin and can cause infection. After you use the Hibiclens, put on clean clothes and make sure sheets on your bed are clean and don't use any powders or lotions. Also, don't shave your surgical leg for at least a few days before surgery since shaving can cause micro tears that can cause bacteria to get in. Most important is hand washing. Be meticulous about washing your hands and making sure others wash theirs, both before and after surgery. And finally, check with your surgeon before you schedule any dental appointments, colonoscopy, or any other invasive procedure both before and after surgery. They each have their own windows of time that they want you to avoid having anything invasive done to help prevent infection. On the day of surgery, follow the instructions given to you by the pre-surgical nurse for when to stop eating and drinking and which of your regular medications you should take the morning of surgery. Remember that no eating also includes no gum, mints, etc. Don't use any powders, lotions, deodorant, makeup, or anything else, and they'll want you to show up two hours before your case. So even if your case starts at 7.30, they'll still want you to be here by 5.30. The good news is, there's not much traffic on the road then. If your case starts at 7 or 7.15, though, you still don't get here until 5.30 because you'll just be sitting in a dark room waiting for someone to show up. We do have free valet parking that starts at 5.30, so just pull up to the front entrance and take the elevator up to the second floor. When you get off of the elevator, you'll see the check-in desk for surgery. While you're in surgery, your coach can wait in the comfortable waiting area. We do have free Wi-Fi throughout so he or she will be able to connect to the internet. We also have a special monitor that shows the status of the patient in surgery. For privacy, it doesn't show your name, but they will give you a special code number, and it will indicate whether you're in the pre-op area, surgery, or recovery. We also have the same monitor down in the cafeteria, so your coach can get a bite to eat and still keep track of your progress. In the pre-op area, we'll put this beautiful gown on you. Start your IV, and make sure you're the correct patient and that we're doing the correct surgery on the correct side. We'll ask you to write yes on the joint you're having replaced and your surgeon will come behind you to initial it to make sure everyone's on the same page. If you're scheduled to receive a nerve block, you'll get it at this time. And we do encourage your coach to stay with you if he or she is able. Then you'll be taken on your stretcher to the operating room, where you'll meet your team of surgeon, nurses, and anesthesiologists. Here you'll receive your anesthesia. We use a couple different types of anesthesia, depending upon surgeon preference and your own health history. Most people are familiar with general anesthesia. That's where they put a mask over your face, you breathe in the gas and fall asleep, and then you wake up when the surgery is over. Most of our surgeons prefer to use spinal anesthesia, this is where they give you some happy juice in your IV so you don't care. Then they give you an injection in your back that numbs you from the waist down. Even with the spinal anesthesia, you won't be wide awake, handing your surgeon his tools, watching him do his thing. You'll still be asleep, similar to when you get a colonoscopy, and you won't feel anything or remember anything when you wake up. After surgery, you'll go to the recovery room, where you'll be connected to monitors that will check your breathing and your heart. You'll get pain medicine if you need it 
and they may take an x-ray of your new joint to make sure everything looks good. We do like to warn you though that depending on the type of anesthesia you receive, you may wake up after surgery unable to move your legs. The nurse may ask you to wiggle your toes and you may not be able to or you may not feel her touching your leg. These are perfectly normal and will resolve, typically within a half hour or so. Once you're recovered, you'll be taken up to the fifth floor surgical unit where you'll meet your team of nurses and clinical technicians. If you see someone in navy blue or white scrubs, that's your registered nurse. She'll be giving you your medicines, working with your surgeon to make sure you're recovering well. If you see someone in teal-colored scrubs, that's your clinical technician. They're going to be taking your vital signs, helping you get cleaned up in the morning, and they're all going to keep a close eye on you to make sure you're safe and comfortable. Once you're in your room, we'll let you order something to eat from our menu. You can choose whatever you'd like to eat within any dietary restrictions you may have. Call the number on the menu and they'll deliver within 45 minutes or so. There are no set times for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You can just order any time between 6.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. We'll also give you medicine for pain if needed, and we're going to get you up and walking the day of surgery with either the physical therapist or, if your case is late, the nurses and clinical technicians. We really want to get you moving. It helps reduce complications, and it's nice to take that new joint for a spin to see how it feels. In most cases, you'll be able to put as much weight as you want on your leg. With walking comes the risk of falling. Because you've received anesthesia, you may be on some strong pain medications, and you may have received a nerve block, which we'll talk about in the next video. And because you're in a strange environment with cords and tubes everywhere, you're going to be at a higher risk of falling. We've had patients fall because they reached for something on the floor and slid off the bed. We've had patients fall because they stood up from the toilet and got lightheaded. We will actually stay in the bathroom with you. We'll give you as much privacy as we can, but we want to keep you safe above all. On the day after surgery, we'll help you get cleaned up, unhook your IV, and take out any drains you may have. Then, physical and occupational therapy will come to your room and do some one-on-one -on -one work with you. Everyone knows physical therapy. They do the exercises, the range of motion, the walking. But occupational therapy helps with the activities of daily living. They teach you how to get dressed, how to put your shoes and socks on when you may not be able to reach your feet. Basically, all you need to know to be as independent as possible once you get home. Depending on how well you do after your morning therapy sessions and how well you've recovered after surgery, you may be cleared to go home by late morning or early afternoon. Otherwise, you'll get additional therapy until you're deemed safe for discharge. This concludes part one of the pre-op joints in motion class. Please continue to part two, where we'll discuss pain management and potential complications.